if you're jumping in, let me know where you're in the world you are. So uh, I will reintroduce myself in case I'm sure a lot of people are watching this are watching this um, are are just joining the group. So my name is Sharon Shachaf. Um, I um, am a human design specialist, um, self uh, self taught. Before uh, I ever work with human design, I still have a long experience, many years of working uh, and with, uh, especially with writers. I started with academic writers. My background is in academia. I myself um, am uh, no longer academia and I'm writing creative nonfiction, memoir and personal essays. Uh, and I work as a writing coach and unblocking co coach. I teach workshops uh, about the creative process. Um, and really my uh, expertise is to work with creative people uh, doesn't have to be writers and help them figure out how to align with their best creative flow and process. Um, so I've been working with people one-on-one -on -one for a uh, year. You know, I had six PhD students while, and many, many, many MA and uh, BA students uh, over the years. And now I work with private clients and in workshops. And when I first encountered human design, I was already working uh, with many uh, creative unblocking techniques um, and come from the creative writing workshop world and a lot of uh, unblocking techniques that come from, uh, you know, just the world of uh, therapy. I have, uh, while we're waiting for people uh, to join in, and I'm, I'm not sure, I think this time it's not going to be mirror. Uh, hi, Sarah. Hi, Adrian. Uh, this is a really great book. I was recommending throughout the week um, books about the creative process uh, that I really think are going to be able to help people decondition um, when they're working with human design. So this book by Victoria, Victoria Nelson is called On Writer's Block, uh, A New Approach to Creativity. Um, and whenever I talk to you guys in the group or when I talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, when I do a reading about embracing the inner child and that the part of you that writes or creates uh, or is creative or artistic is actually the youngest, most vulnerable part. You need to talk to that part of you like it's a five-year-old. Uh, this book is a really good uh, contribution that really lays out how to work with that child and how to understand the writer's block. Now, I remember Adrian is here. So Adrian, I think it was you uh, posted at one time uh, this real beautiful image that said, the obstacle is the path. Um, this is my approach to writer's block. Uh, I know a lot of people feel a certain kind of way about even using the word block. Um, but I think it's useful, and I've said it before, uh, when something feels stuck inside, you want to make that feeling your friend. That feeling might have something to tell you about what's going on that you are doing, um, I don't want to say doing wrong, but um, a place where you're directing energies, where your own energies end up getting you stuck because you're trying to go against what we call in human design, your inner authority. Um, so that was a, a quick recommendation that I forgot last time, Victoria Nelson, uh, the writer's block. Uh, but I want to talk today about um, um, a couple of things. And the main theme that I wanted to cover today in this live, um, and definitely answer your questions if you have, uh, it's, it's uh, Giselle, it's Victoria Nelson. And I will always post links to whatever book I am recommending. Um, so there will be a link for uh, how to buy this on Amazon or something later on. All right, so today I want to delve in, and it doesn't have to be a really long live, except if you have a lot of questions, I'm always happy to answer your questions. But I want to delve in and talk about the deconditioning process. Because for a lot of people just entering the experiment in human design, and uh, please, uh, if you're watching this and you want to let me know that you're if you are totally new to human design, I don't want this... Uh, to be this foreign language for you. So I'm gonna break it down a little bit more, what all of that means. So according to human design, um, we, as all of you probably have seen, you know, we have each one have their body graph. Each one has this very unique 
imprint that has to do with where the sun, earth, planets, and everything was three months before you were born. That's the red side of your chart. And then the moment you were born and you were completely outside your mother's womb, and that's the uh, black side. These two sets of definitions are two different entities that are held together in our G center, in that, you know, the traditional heart chakra. And form our special, unique, differentiated uh, character, who we are, how we are designed. Now, you know, we all have all the different potentials. When you look at your uh, human design body graph, you have all the 64 um, gates. Uh, you have all the different channels, but some of them are defined or colored in and some of them are not defined or not colored in. And the stuff that you have not defined is what we call the not self. These are energies that you can uh, definitely experience. In fact, when you experience energies that are in your not self, you amplify them, but you must not be confused to think that those energies are yours to keep. Uh, and so whenever we're encountering anything that we don't have defined, that can become an opening for us to suffer through what we call what we call in human design the conditioning process. Um, so the conditioning process is basically something that starts the minute you, you're born and you are fed for the first time, and definitely when you're interacting with other people, because you have you know in you have your own imprint. It creates your special type and aura. So for example, I'm a manifester. Um, when my daughter was born, she's a projector right there. You know, we were meeting, we, she was greeted by a mother who was a manifester. So thus began her journey in life. So I had a really good question this week. Somebody asked me on the group, well, what if I was born the same exact minute as somebody else, then why aren't we the exact same? And here is the deal with that. Nobody can ever be the exact same because from the moment you are born, you start interacting with specific not selves. Your parents, your siblings, your environment, you are fed a certain way. There are different, I want to say traumas because well, maybe that's my background. I'm Jewish and you know, um, there's a lot of trauma and pain and suffering around uh, feeding and the anxiety around with the baby eat this and the baby eat that. And, and that, for example, that stress that comes into the feeding relationship. Say, I want to nurse my babies. And maybe there's somebody in my family that's like, you shouldn't nurse them, or this is how you should nurse them, or you should feed them this, or you should feed them that. Right there, just through that arena of how you're being fed and what kind of drama goes around you as a baby when you're being fed, that's going to create a unique set of conditioning forces on you. So the way you interact, you know, if your parents are a different type, you know, what happens in that auric encounter, what happens in every aspect of your life, even as a tiny little baby, all of that is going to um, create a conditioning which basically creates this uh, a world that's homogenized. We are all taught to proceed as if we're all this one thing. Now, a lot of uh, people in this group are manifestors and we have uh, a, a lot of projectors as well. Uh, you all know that we are not like 70% of the population. So those of you who have the sacral defined, uh, you know, are the majority. So a lot of us non-sacral beings, for example, are hijacked into this generator world, we always feel a little bit off and we're not the same as everybody. We, we don't chime with the generators the way they envelope each other and are uh, in this ping pong, as Pavaka Katsir calls it, the ping pong and back and forth that's really easy for generators when they're with each other. Um, and then in comes a projector, in comes a manifester, and it's a different aura. And while the kids around you don't know to say, oh, you're a manifester, you're a projector, they do know energetically that you are not the same as them. And that, you know, becomes uh, an opening for a lot of uh, negative feelings and trauma of rejection. Um, and it goes both ways. It's not like, oh, the horrible generators are doing this to us. Absolutely not. A generator that has a manifester or a projector as a mother, uh, and, you know, they might come to that mother and, you know, approach her like, 
they want to be approached, you know, asking her a lot of questions, telling her a lot of things. Um, all of these things can create um, tension, trauma, a feeling of rejection, feeling that you're not being loved, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the process of deconditioning uh, and the process of deblocking, of unblocking is what I want to talk to you guys about today. The deconditioning process when you start entering human design is basically what this is all about. So as you begin to learn about what you really are, what yourself is, what you have defined, your, your gates, your, you know, your cross, your profile, um, the centers you have defined and the centers you have open, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, um, it's a really deep, profound process that can be very hard. And in human design, um, the understanding is that it takes seven full years of deconditioning until every cell in your body is replaced with a new cell uh, as you experiment with making decisions and living energetically and interacting with other people based on what you really are, not based on that homogenized world. So I'll give you an example. If you're a projector, um, or you're a manifester or whatever you are, but I'll, I'll do a projector example as not to uh, over concentrate on manifestors. If you're a projector, your whole life, you had to wait for an invitation when you are um, interacting with other types. And you didn't know that. So you can become very uh, upset and bitter. Uh, and it feels, it feels unfair, like, why do I have to, uh, you know, when you first learn about this, you can have that response of, you know, why am I not allowed to just initiate? And it's not a question of allowed or not allowed. The beauty of strategy and authority is that if you're a projector and you're learning about your unique, powerful aura, you can penetrate into the other. And the generators, they have no, uh, I was just watching this video from Pravaka yesterday about how the, the generator and, and projector dance. And I was watching that so that I can help my own daughter who is a projector uh, and of course my clients. Um, and she was talking about how the, the generators sometimes feel like, oh my God, this is penetrating me. Their aura is really open and enveloping. And so they can close up and create a feeling of rejection for the projector. Now, if the projector waits, learns how to do that dance with the generators, waiting to be invited to say, hey, do you want to hear what I have to say? And the gen or the, if the generator is like, hey, projector, what's up? Uh, and the projector would ask, do you want to hear what I have to say? And if the generator has a uh-huh and invites the projector, then the projector would be able to do what they do best, which is to guide the generator's energy in a correct way way and everybody involved will be happy and content and uh the work the purpose of the projector to guide the energy of the generator uh would be fulfilled um so you know me as a manifester i am here to inform uh or uh, impact i'm not here to inform our, our informing is a, a strategy that's uh you know uh not mechanical to us as manifestors, but we're definitely here to impact. But guess what? Even manifestors need to wait many, many times for different reasons before they can decide to just go for it and impact. If we impact without an um, invitation, so for example, if our channels, my channels are projected. So although I'm a manifestor and I don't have to wait for an invitation, I can get up and do, I have to wait for certain things. I have to wait for my emotional wave, first of all, so that I have clarity. I have to not try to manifest from my will because my ego is undefined. So there's no, there's no energy there for me to will any manifestation. I have to surrender to what comes up in my uh, definition, in my process. And uh, if you look at my chart, there are a lot of gates that are actually there about, uh, that are all about waiting for the correct time. And I have the 33 and 31 in my throat, which means I cannot be spontaneous in sharing things and I cannot impose my manifestations on others, especially since a lot of my uh, process is about impacting others about their own creative process. It makes no sense for me to be um, forcing that on anybody. Now I can tell you for me, as somebody who's a professor for 20 years, 
I can tell you for sure that when, whenever I would uh, un, be uninvited, but still try to help somebody like a student, right? There is this basic situation where you're the professor and you have all these students and you are supposed to try to impact them a certain way. But I can tell you from my experience that definitely whenever I try to wheel my help or guidance or impact on a student and they were not ready for that and they were not willing, it ended badly. Now, when I, I kind of intuited that. So I was always waiting for students to be ready for me to impact them. And when everything aligns and the student or whoever it is, is or the client or my children, when they are ready for my impact, it's wonderful, it's great. And when I don't try to impact from uh, my mind or from my willpower that I don't have, um, but I let my emotional process and my emotional way feed into my root and into, that's what I have defined, my spleen and then to my throat and I share, then it's perfect. So what happens when we start deconditioning? Um, one of the first things that happen is that confusion, I think, because or, or even uh, frustration, jealousy, uh, feeling of bitterness, like all of these signatures of um, why am I not this and why am I not there? Like for me, I think as a manifester, it was really amazing to discover about my aura. Um, and so I started really experimenting with that and seeing that um, the impact of my aura. Um, but it also made me really sad it made me really sad to understand that a lot of the time when I come at people and my intention is to me so um, pure and I want to help and I want to impact and I, 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 my intentions are good. I want to help people with whatever they have going. Um, and people are like, whoa, you know, a lot of people just view me as outrageous or forceful, you know, over my life. So there is a period of grief sometimes and mourning even and and like woe is me you know and also based on your design um and your motivation it can be different feelings where you're like oh my god everybody else gets to just do this and me as a manifester i don't get to do that so you know or a generator learning that they're not supposed to uh initiate or a projector learning that they're supposed to wait for an invitation it can certainly bring up a lot of um really fierce kind of negative um, self-thinking. And that is obviously, you know, it's not helpful or useful, but it's also a very natural part of the process and it's something that you need to breathe through it. So now I wanna jump into some tools that I really believe can help um, align deconditioning with um, unblocking. So if you are a creative type and you've been exposed to human design and you now see all of these things that are in your chart or you've had a reading and had somebody walk you through what you what you are how your process work uh etc i don't want to get too much into that because i did other videos uh, specifically about how i approach working with people i really i look at what you really have going and teach you to accept that these are your gifts and this is what you're here to do and you might have certain several different things that you're here to do and they may have a split in between them right and so you need to trust that you know your process that you have going between your g and your ego if they're not connected to what you have between your root and your sling for example that it's okay to wait for these two processes to get bridged and to accept that for example but anyways as you are discovering all that a really helpful tool I find is um, what's called in the creative world the morning pages. I have here uh, Julia Cameron's The Right to Write. Again, I will post that uh, link and I, I recommended that before and she talks about morning pages. Now listen, I will explain why they are, I explained it before, but I want to do a, uh, say a disclaimer. Uh, in human design, you never ever have to prescribe to one remedy that's good for everybody. So for example, the morning pages thing, it's the idea is you get up first thing in the morning and you free flow, you write, uh, and you take a blank page. And I wanna show you, I buy these blank uh, sketch pads. I buy them in carts of 40 from the dollar store. So for $40, I get you know 40 uh, uh, of these and they have 40 blank pages. Um, but what I'm trying to say is I definitely know a lot of manifestors, but other types as well who are like, I just 
I don't let, or people with open ego who don't want to promise that they will be there every morning at a certain time, at a certain hour, writing three pages. It's so prescribed and they feel like turned off from this thing. So let me tell you what I do. I don't do these pages in the morning. Uh, sometimes I do, but a lot of the time I've observed my own flow and my perfect time to do these is when everybody goes to sleep. And um, I mean, my relaxed evening, night kind of flow. And then I would sit down and write. And a lot of the time what comes up um, about you know, I write about my day, about my relationships, about things I've, you know, everything kind of combines together. And I really get a lot of uh, deconditioning epiphanies. So what I am suggesting is, especially if you're a writer and you feel blocked or you're a creative type and you feel blocked, practicing any, at any moment of the day, sitting there and just writing your thoughts, it, it opens a channel. And in that channel, things can start coming to you that um, it'll help integrate your process and you will learn something new. Now, if that doesn't feel right for you to uh, do it, you know, I'm going to do morning pages every morning as I wake up. That's my new year resolution, especially open ego people. Then, you know, don't approach it in that way. You got to find a way to approach it that works well with your process. Um, but... What happens with the deconditioning process is that you discover something and then you experiment with it for a while and then you're gonna to have to get back to it. So I'll give you an example for my uh, ego. Hello, Sarah. Um, and by the way, people, uh, let me know when you're come, jumping in if you are, I'm really interested to know where. Oh, Trinidad and Tobago, hi, all right, that's crazy. I love it. Um, we're a pretty global bunch in here. All right, so Sarah, where are you uh, coming from? I know, Adrian, you're from uh, Las Vegas. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, the deconditioning process and the unblocking process and a little bit about the circularity of it. So this week on my group, I posted this uh, really useful to me uh, uh, post from another group, from uh, Kathleen Ruby's group, that had a list of your open centers and if you have them open, the hierarchy of uh, their role in the deconditioning. And it went some, I have it up here. So it was, you know, if you have the ego open, then it's going to be the most powerful, I guess the most vulnerable place for you. Um, and then it goes down solar, G, spleen, ajna, head, root, and sacral. Uh, now listen. Again with that, um, it's, I don't know where they got it from. To me, this really made a lot of sense, but to you, it may not make a lot of sense. And you might feel, you know, I've had people come up and say, you know, I have the ego open, but I really feel like the root, um, you know, somebody said to me, like, uh, although the root is down there, I feel like the root pressure was, was the first or, you know, the main thing that was bothering me. And, you know, then we looked together at her chart and it was like, well, the root also had... Um, or the, her ego had uh, gates that were in her sun earth. So she, and the root had nothing. So, you know, when you have defined gates in an open center, you have a little bit more of yourself in that center. So I don't mean to say that, you know, anything is prescribed in that way, but I did want to give you an example for from my own uh, process of deconditioning how I did discover it for me. So for me, it's the ego, then the G, uh, then the Ajna in the head, and then the sacral. Um, so listen, I knew about the ego to begin with. The minute I read about human design, and I had nothing defining the ego, I totally immediately understood that the ego is, has been what has been distorting and derailing my process since I was born, basically. Um, you know, then I started looking in, in, in the charts of my family and my sister has the ego defined, my older sister. So that's definitely right there, you know. And so also before I even knew about human design or already in um, things like therapy sessions and uh, all my unblocking work, I already knew that I had an ego issue. The way I experienced it before human design and the epiphanies I had just working with the unblocking uh, techniques, 
I always felt that whenever I try to do something for external validation, it fucks me up, basically. If I try to do anything um, to prove, well, that's what we call it in human design, right? To prove that I am worthy. I didn't know that I was trying to prove that I am worthy and that I don't know what worthiness even is because I have nothing defining my ego, but I definitely, by the time I was 40, uh, understood that if I observe my process, whenever I am asked to write something that needs to either secure my material, like, you know, the stuff that I had to write as, as an academic, I had to publish or perish. And it worked for a while, and after a while, I was like, I did not. As my uh, a child I once knew that was three years old said, I can't want to. I could not want to produce anything that did not come from this inner well inside me and that got hijacked by the process of proving I'm, I'm worthy and, and you know, proving that I deserve to have a job or proving that I deserve to keep my job. And that was totally poison for me. Um, so the ego for me really was the main culprit and I knew it already. Now, the next one in line, right, for me is the G because the next one is the solar, but my solar is defined. So the next one in line is the G. And I do want to explain about that because that one was so tricky to me that I didn't understand it at all. So what happens with your G center? Your G center is where you... Uh, either have it defined or not defined, to feel that you have direction and lovability. So for me, I wasn't so worried about lovability. Uh, and I wonder, you know, I could, again, when, when we work with, when I work with people, we can kind of figure out why, what this is about. And, you know, it could be that I was not, I am not yet ready in my own process to really look at my, um, own process with lovability. Uh, but I will say I had a, a generator mother on the cross, of uh, the vessel of love and i do think that with all else aside you know she was always really good at making me feel loved uh you know she would know how to make me feel loved while she was struggling with my aura and energy so i think that that could be a part of this but long story short the g so as i started the conditioning i spent the first few months just observing the ego of course, I looked also at the sacral, and it definitely is a non-sacral being. I looked at all of these things, but I zoomed in on it. And what I was doing was I rewrote the story of my life, not for publication, not for anybody else to read. You know, I can pull out here. You can see I have, like, folders and folders of just stuff I've written in morning pages. I just sat there, not through making myself, not through promising I will be doing right, but it came flowing out of me. And I reviewed my entire creative life and my creative process from that lens of that open ego. Um, and it became very easy for me to see in my body, and Adrian, if you're here still, right? In my body, it was really easy to see. And Adrian always recommends, you know, staying in your body. How it feels when that ego energy hijacks my creativity when it becomes about, oh, I have to prove. Uh, and for me specifically, it was like, I have to be big in the world. Why? Because as a manifester, I have the legitimate um, desire to impact. But when I was trying to impact out of my open ego to prove that I can impact, that was bad news. All right, so then the G. That was tricky for me. Uh, and then I started looking at, 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 at that, but it's so funny because I didn't even see that list, but I was, wa I was working through in that order. Um, so the thing with the G is I was trying to force a direction and it's not for me to force a direction for anything in life. I, it's hard, especially for a manifester to accept, wait, you know, I am not, but, but actually everybody, right? I am not supposed to decide a direction. And what is this business with the right place, right? So with, your, when you're with an open G, you need to be in the right place and then the right opportunities and the right people would come to you. Um, and you're not supposed to have a fixed identity. And again, at the time as I was deconditioning, I was leaving behind academia. 
So then I started writing a lot in my morning pages or whatever, the journaling, the, the free flowing. I started writing a lot about what a fixed identity meant for me. And then I kind of started discovering that throughout my life, I was in a different identity, a different thing every time, and that I tend to over-identify. So for example, when I became a professor and there was a door downtown Atlanta that said Dr. Sharon Shachaf on the door, I discovered through the writing process that I was just writing about it, that that was like a crutch. I used that as a crutch to fix my identity as, as this one thing. Um, but, and then when it went away, I was like, oh my God, I don't have that crutch for my identity. So who am I? If I am not a professor that does this or that. And so looking back at the period of time when I left academia, I still was working really hard to publish stuff that I promised that I would publish. Again, open ego. It's not my business to do stuff just because I promised to do it if it doesn't make sense for me. But it was to uphold my identity as an academic that was very important for me. And then pay attention how this gets into the next level, which is the Ajna. So the Ajna is our center of conceptualization. And mine is absolutely open. The Ajna was working to conceptualize a framework for how to go about doing all that stuff that my ego and my G said I need to do. And then my head was busy thinking about things that are not important to keep me doing the, the beating of the open G to secure my identity that it was not supposed to be fixed so that my ego is satisfied that I'm big in the world and I'm proving my worth. You see how it works? And then the last bit of it was the sacral. So I was giving my sacral that I, that's not mine, I was getting my work and I was slaving away at publishing and writing and doing all these things so that my, uh, that my head was telling me to do because it was thinking about things that were not important, that my agenda was telling me to do because it was conceptualizing a framework on how to secure my identity that I didn't need to fix because of my open G, all of that, so that my ego feels I can prove my worth. Now, how exhausting is this? And pay attention, I was already doing this as I was deconditioning. So as I was deconditioning, I was writing about these things and I started observing my own loop with this. Now, here's the good news. What I've discovered this week writing about, all again, this all comes to me as I write in free flow. I understood something very, very basic. and but very helpful. Because the sacral is actually the weakest link in my deconditioning, right? It has the least, in a way, it has the least power on me. That was the place where I could stop it all. By refusing, by refusing to give my work when my inner authority didn't feel that it was correct. So again, I see some people are joining, so let me recap, right? As I was deconditioning, for me, I discovered that my ego, which is my main conditioning, was driving the whole show, making me work really hard to prove my worth by trying to secure a, an identity for myself. So at first it was I was a professor, and then it was, okay, I'm, now I'm a writer, and I'm this and I'm that. Like, how do I secure it? And I don't need to secure it. I don't need to fix my identity, right? But I was trying to do what the G wanted so to satisfy the, what my ego, which is driving my not self. So my ego is driving my not self by telling me you have to prove yourself by fixing your identity because I have an open G. And then the Ajna jumps in to give you a conceptual framework of how that might look. And I was reading about, you know, how do you publish? How do you do, right? And then your head starts thinking about things that don't matter. Like, how do I find an agent? instead of, you know, letting myself just write something. And when I will write something, it will open the right doors, right? And then all of that was, the linchpin of that was my sacral because I was allowing my open sacral to be plugged into that kind of relentless work. So the good news is the minute I started experimenting with my inner authority and the sacral was so easy for me to understand and I started waiting and not doing. And it, my mind was screaming, holy hell. What do you mean you're gonna sit on the couch and read memoirs instead of doing this or doing that or doing this or doing that, you know, instead of working? But I just did it. 
I awaited in uncertainty. All right, so now we're, we're going to go back up the chain of command. So my sacral, I could stop it by not doing and waiting and not committing it to work on things that, I, that my head was telling me were important to think about, that my ajna created a conceptual framework or certainty. If I do this, this, and that, this, this, and that happen, so that I can secure my G, my open identity, and I can fix an identity and have a sense of fixed identity so that my ego would feel I am proving my worth. This not self mess was distorting my whole process. And I'm talking to you about a process I've already knew how to deblock, unblock, sorry. And I was already deep in deconditioning. So it takes a long time. So what I'm trying to tell you, like, it's not, it's not like a moment comes and, and you, everything clicks into place and you're deconditioned. I already knew how to cheat the ego. I already knew how to show up for just writing whatever comes. And then I had to learn how to endure the chatter of the mind that were saying, but is it worthy? Are you gonna prove yourself? Are you going to secure your identity? Are you going to do all of this, right? Is it gonna be okay? Is it gonna be, ah? you know, this panic that comes from the ego. And it's like, no wonder the ego is also about securing your material existence. So then my uh, spleen that is defined was giving a lot of fears. I have a lot of, almost all the gates in the spleen are defined. So then, you know, even though your spleen can, or your center can be defined for you, it does not mean it's not participating in your not self death. So for example, for me, the, the fears from my spleen were fueling some of the behaviors, the overdoing to satisfy my ego so that I would prove myself worthy in the world, right? You see, so it all works in cahoots to mess you up. It's a not self mess, but it takes a long time. It doesn't matter what authority you are, it takes what inner authority and what your strategy is. It takes a long time as you experiment with, with these things to learn how to slowly decondition them. So for me, it was the sacral was the, the weakest link and I could just stop working and begin resting and recharging and just honor what I was learning about myself as a manifester. And that was, even though I didn't understand the full process mentally, it didn't matter because none of this matter mentally. As long as I aligned with my strategy and my authority and I was informing. So for example, I informed my spouse, hey, I'm taking a year off because I'm experiencing this, experiencing this transition and I'm not expecting to be viable in terms of making a living for the foreseeable future. And I know you have us, right? He, he can pay the bills. And that was it. And he was like, fine, you know? So by, while, by informing him that and allowing myself to have my process, I was able for the first time in my life to really just let go of working, 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 working through all of these other steps to prove my worth. Now, it's going to be different for everybody. Everybody's going to have a different process. Um, when we do a reading together, when you work or you know, when you do your own deconditioning, when you look at your own uh, body graph, what you have defined, what you don't have defined, it's going to be a different uh, process and it, it circles back. So I will tell you, I started with the ego. I understood some things. I went out and experimented with that. I released academic writing and I decided I didn't, I, I, observed that I want to do a lot more creative writing. And then I took a writing class. So I'm, I'm giving you a relapse, not a relapse, another layer, right? I, I went into the writing class and my ego got triggered immediately in that class. He didn't get triggered by people coming at me and saying, prove yourself. You know how it got triggered? It got triggered because I was praised the teacher in the class and other, praised my work and other students in the class praised my work or, you know, even expressed some sort of projections because I'm a 5'1 of, of jealousy about my work. And before I knew it, I was blocked in my writing again. Like during the time I was doing the class, I was flowing. I, you know, each week I wrote something new and it was amazing and incredible. But when the class was over, 
it was some sort of a collapse because all of a sudden I didn't want to do it. And then it took me a long time of saying, okay, I don't want, I don't want to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do any writing when I don't want to do it. What is going on? And I had to wait for clarity because I'm an emotional person. And I waited and waited. And then I understood, oh, praise is as bad for me as criticism is. So it was hijacking my whole process. And by getting praise that my writing is good, that made me, um, it made my whole process. So, okay, I was getting praised that I'm a good writer as a creative writer. Then my G was like, oh, I need to secure my identity as a creative writer now. Then my Ajna was like, let's figure out the steps. Let's build a conceptual framework. You need to publish. You need to do this. You need to do that. Hire a writing coach that would teach you how to get those steps, right? Not from my body. Even talking about this now feels all tense stuff because that's never my process. My process is hide away, create something amazing, and when it's ready, the door would open. I would find a way to publish it. I would find, right? All right, so next in line, right? My G wanted to secure this identity. My Ajna created steps. My head started thinking, thinking about many, many things that didn't matter. I need to find a publisher. I need to find an agent. How do I do this? How do I do that? All that noise. And then I was giving my sacral that or I was allowing, I was behaving as if I have the sacral defined. And by the way, I have it defined in the transit for a year now. So that's another thing. But I was pulled into starting working on that, working, reading about publishing, looking for agents, all that stuff prematurely. I'm not saying all of these things um, are not important to know, but it was hijacking and sucking the life and the energy out of my creative process. So then I caught myself and the way I caught myself was not by cerebrally explaining this to myself like I'm explaining this to you now. It was by strategy and authority. It was by radically not doing and waiting and stopping all production and just not touching it. And my mind was screaming as I said, holy hell, like how can you make progress if you're not gonna but I didn't feel like writing it anymore. I had these beautiful six essays that I wrote that were beautiful. And I hired a coach who told me, all you need to do is to, to polish them and send them out to publication. It didn't feel right. So I stopped, dropped and roll. I didn't do it. And by stopping from my sacral, I was able to slowly roll back. I didn't have to think about these things that don't matter. I didn't have to believe the Ajna that given me certainty that I have to do this or that. I didn't have to hold up my G that I'm a writer or I'm a this or I'm a that. And I didn't have to prove to my ego that I can prove to the world I'm important. In that break that I took, something percolated inside. You want to know what that is? This group doing this. So I was rewarded, you know, by the program or whatever. I was rewarded for stopping and I didn't need to cerebrally understand all that. All I needed to do was follow my strategy and wait for clarity about, and also noticing my body. If I don't want to do the writing that I know I'm fully capable and talented and inspired to do, then I'm not going to do it. Now, I know a lot of you, when you first entered this, you're like, who has time for this? I need to make a living. You know, who has that? You think I thought I had time to have my career collapse at 45? <laughs> you know, well, 43. You think I had, I thought, oh, it would be great to just let everything I knew about my identity and how I work and who I am collapse around me. No, that's not how that works. But what happened was at some point in my career, as I was trying to manifest from that place of ego, there was no more energy for that. And these doors started shutting in my face. And so I had to pay attention. So I actually think, you know, if you can preemptively engage in the deconditioning process, that can save you. Um, oh, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing other, I should have said before, I, I will answer questions or, or look at the comments at the end because I, as a manifester, I have this creative flow, but now I see there were, uh, some questions. So, all right. So, um, to fit, to finish that thought, and then I want to, uh, see if you guys have specific questions or you can post your charts and I can start take a look at yours. 
I didn't anticipate that having everything I built over 20 years collapse would be a great thing, okay? It's not like I thought that would be great. So I totally understand how your mind screams holy hell when you're being told, you know, go ahead and decondition and listen to your inner authority, you know, a, a generators. Don't do anything that feels yucky. You're not supposed to do anything that you don't feel you're sacrally saying aha to. You know, if you're an emotional generator, you wait for clarity on the way. Spleen people, if your spleen tells you not to do it, don't do it. You know, it could be the best, most amazing opportunity on paper, but if your spleen is telling you not to do it, don't do it. Um, you know, even ego manifestors or you know, even if if you have a G, you know, a projector that with uh, inner authority G, uh, you still have to wait to listen to what that authority is telling you to do. And let me tell you, a lot of the time, it's not going to be the same as what your mind is telling you to do. So learning how to wait and following radically what your authority is can save you. You know, I'm really thinking... If I had known all this, maybe just maybe, I didn't, you know, have to witness my entire uh, previous career falling apart. I'm glad it did because I'm a happy, happier now than I've ever been. But um, maybe there would have been a way to figure out how to dance the dance with that world if I had known that my ego is hijacking my process. So I think it's never a bad time to start to radically decondition those open centers when you're making decisions when they're not in yourself. All right, so enough for me. Uh, I do want to go back and see if there were questions. Um, so we have, all right, um, would love to hear about to what degree your deconditioning was like figuring out the puzzle and to what degree that had a direct experience of the energy. Oh, that's a great question. So the question is, uh, I'm not sure I can say your name right, Torstein, um, right? I would say this, my initial, so the question is how much of, of the deconditioning is cerebral and how much of the deconditioning is uh, an embodied experience? I wanna say something radical. 100% of the deconditioning experience is not cerebral, not what we're doing here. But having said that, knowing and understanding it is kind of like almost for me, especially, I mean, I don't know for other people, but for me, knowing it was a precondition. So it's a little bit of a paradox, but let me explain what I mean. What I describe to you now is a mental construct of me cerebrally figuring out what happened when I was allowing myself to follow my inner authority. Because when you would ask me throughout that process, and I'm describing you, to you uh, two or three years, right? As I was on my way, because I'm an emotional being, when I was up, I felt, oh, I'm doing great. When I was down, I was like, oh my God, what am I doing, right? So following the strategy is a blind, non-rational, decision or thing right you, you follow it despite what your brain is your mind is screaming at you uh you're messing everything up how dare you just be at home you know for me it was also i had a big condition about as a woman i cannot be a stay-at-home mom i really always felt like i have to be big in the world and it was my ego i have to prove that i i have to prove to my kids that i'm in the world and i'm earning a living and you know what turns out they don't care <laughs> I mean, they're happy for me when I'm happy. They don't care to know that I'm big in the world. That was my ego telling me that that was important. Um, so again, back to the question. Yeah, I would say uh, uh, it, it helps to know all of that. It's very helpful. It's a precondition, right? You, you want to understand at least strategy and authority in your type. And then the actual work of deconditioning happens only as you experiment with this knowledge in your day-to-day -day life um, making decisions as yourself. Having said that, I personally spent a ton of time listening, reading, studying this. I'm a one line, so I'm an investigator. It comes very um, easily for me and, and naturally for me. 
Um, and it kept my, my mind busy, you know, so some of it just kept my mind busy while I was, um, you know, allowing myself to make decisions from my emo. And I, I'll say another thing. I didn't fully immediately understand what my authority means. So we, we're going to have another video on that, of just what it is to, to wait. And I, will, I, I want to say another thing about that. If you have an emotional authority and you're watching this, when I first entered the human design uh, experiment and I would ask people in groups, what is emotional authority? What do you mean to wait? I would get some really impatient answers. Just wait. I, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't understand what it means. What do you mean I'm waiting? I can wait, especially as a manifestor. Like, I need that. I, it was the hardest thing in the goddamn world for me to learn how to wait. So I'm going to do a whole video and possibly a series about waiting and the art of waiting. But what I will say to you about waiting is that being actively passive is a an art and it's also very hard because in our world there is very little legitimacy to doing it so people looking at you from the outside are like what the fuck are you doing you're, you're not doing anything right people that are close to you and dear to you and love you are panicking because you're not doing anything and, and they don't understand necessarily what is going on so you have to be very um willing to accept that you will need to hold your own space around the waiting and that nobody from the outside has any bearing or saying about what you're going to do. Now, it, it's same with, you know, different authorities. So, for example, if you're splenic and your spleen is telling you no on a decision that seems rational, oh, you were offered a really great job, it pays well, it's the job of your dream, but your spleen is telling you no, you're going to be, especially if you have an open ego like I do, you're going to be like, it's going to be very hard for you to justify to everybody else in your life why you're not taking the job because your spleen told you not to do it. It doesn't seem to make any sense. All right, so it's a question of holding up your own space. Let me see. I saw there was another question. Oh, good. Uh, Mada, you're saying I went through the same process reviewing my whole life. Isn't it great, though? Uh, my morning pages are taking are talking with my husband. Uh, okay, I want to say something about that. Uh, there is a really important part in this process for doing it, or at least part of it, completely alone by yourself. So I would definitely, I'm, I, I think it's wonderful if you can talk to a loved one, uh, if, if you know you have a supportive uh, partner, husband, friend, I've done a lot of that, uh, but I do recommend also creating a, a space where you only, only talk with your own self about this, because um, at the end of the day, how can you learn how to listen to your inner authority if you're not willing to do that? All right, let me see other question. Uh, I'm plagued with if only thoughts. Oh my, don't I know that then? So uh, is your, uh, and that was uh, Giselle. Giselle, is your uh, ego defined? Um, are not defined because I would say that uh, well it could be a lot it could be many things your mind can be talking open spleen open ego with this what if what if Oof, I did a lot of this and it's uh, it's draining um, I think at the end of the day the the goal is to answer those what if questions and understand that there are no mistakes everything happens for a reason um, I definitely would. what if I've not taken that job and I taken that job all of that that yeah it's, it can be draining. All right, let me see if there are any other questions that I've missed. All right. Meditation is my keynote. Yes, meditation can be uh, great um, for that. So I actually also offer re written meditations, uh, but I do want to wrap up at, at an hour. So um, listen, guys, also, I know today I was just jumping in to see uh, to talk about some thoughts, and it's not a very organized thing. Um, I want to talk about my future uh, plans um, for uh, this group and for um, my um, my own work with this. I am planning to, uh, now that I've done the special and I've booked way more than I was going to, now I'm, uh, I'm going to be tied up with doing one-on-one -on -one readings until uh, the second week of February at least. And um, I also want to withdraw 
and have time to kind of look at what I've learned from all of this. And then I want to offer uh, classes and courses. And one of the main, I think the first class I want to offer would be, um, I don't want to call it memoir because you don't have to see yourself as a memoir writer, but basically a, a group where we do that process of deconditioning through writing personal narratives. And they could be fictional or non-fictional, um, but, and, 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 and it, that, it could be something that you end up developing into a publishable uh, product, but absolutely does not have to be that. Uh, I can, I'm very good at taking people through to the publishing process, but I want to do this group um, more for your process of deconditioning. Um, so this is something I would be offering up on this group soon. But um, starting, I think, uh, next week or two weeks from now, I will be doing more organized uh, lectures or seminars on this group that would be bringing together my workshops and expertise that I already have created on the creative process with specific human design themes. Uh, so, you know, one week we would be talking about inner authority and another week about open centers, another week about channels and so on and so forth. I am telling you all of this because I'm inviting you, if you're watching this now and certainly all the people that will be watching it later, to let me know specific topics or questions that you would like covered in that kind of thing. All right, so let me see if there are any last questions. Oh, did I just, what did I do? All right, oh, here I am. Been doing a lot of different things and deconditioning constantly, but human design talks about how to make decisions and how to think about the deconditioning. So there's a lot of new valuable ways of acting and thinking. Absolutely, I mean, I should qualify. I mean, for me, definitely studying all this information is part and parcel of how I approach the deconditioning process. Um, but at the end of the day, the reason I said 100% of it is embodied experiment is that I really do believe that you can't start to create this the change inside on the cellular level by just thinking about this. It's really fun to think about. It's really great to learn. It's really great to learn and then experiment with. But without that second part of then experimenting with it, deconditioning doesn't happen, if that makes sense. All right, sweet friends, thank you so much for jumping. I know uh, uh, it's an hour now, so I want to finish. I know uh, 10.30 is a little early, uh, but to be honest, I have a really wonderful yin yoga class that I like to attend uh, 12.30 and on Friday afternoon. So I decided to jump in early and just see what questions came up and talk to you guys a little bit. Um, I'm looking forward uh, over the next month or so, I'm going to have uh, a lot of one-on-one -on -one readings with a lot of people who are in this group and I cannot wait. I also want to hear from the people who already work with me. If, uh, you know, uh, tell me how the writing is going, feel free to continue to keep me in your process in, and inform me on how it is going. And definitely uh, feel free to message me, email me, uh, and ask me questions and post your chart on the group and ask questions because people are also answering each other's questions. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Happy New Year and a happy new decade.